Hello, welcome back to the Technology Policy Institute's podcast, To Think Minimum. It's Thursday, July 30th, 2020. I'm Sarah O, oh, Senior Fellow at TPI, and I'm joined by Scott Walston and Nathaniel Levin. Today, we're delighted to talk to Philippe Hoffa, Developer Advocate and Software Engineer at Google. Philippe is originally from Chile and is now based in San Francisco and around the world. If you're involved in big data and data science, you may recognize him as a familiar name and face, answering thousands of developer questions on Stack Overflow and Reddit, which are read by millions of programmers. For Google, he also records tutorial videos on YouTube, gives conference talks on big data, and writes blog posts on the latest developments in cloud tools. Philippe is a leading voice on Google's cloud computing products. Thanks, Philippe, for joining us on To Think Minimum today. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Here at TPI, we are big fans of your work. It's a treat for us to host you on the program. We've used Google Cloud Tools for several research papers. And for our listeners, many of whom may not be familiar with cloud computing, could you explain a little bit about the trend in the last 10 years towards cloud, what BigQuery is, and how people use it? Cool. Oh, there's so much in that question. I love that a big part of our conversation today is also how you saw this trend. Like, so you've been doing econometrics and the studies for this many years, and you are getting increasingly larger and larger problems. Please, you can tell me, like, there is a moment where whatever supercomputers you have in your university research center are not enough. And that's when the cloud comes. It's not your computer. It's just a place where you can get the results that you want and you don't need to invest in any... It's not your computers. You can just get them even by the second if you need uh, three, 5,000 computers to work during 30 seconds in the problem that you have to solve. Is that how you see it? Yes, definitely. That's one of the reasons why I personally am such a big fan. We don't have to pay for a server room or a technician and we don't even need a lot of bandwidth on our own computers. It's you just truly send, the democratization of powerful computing. You just send one terminal line to the computers out there and they've crunched the numbers, they store the numbers. It's amazing. Exactly. So what size of data you're working on? Like I've been also following your work and I've been impressed by what you have published. Well, I'll let you say the number. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know if it's that big in your eyes, but for us, 40 terabytes is pretty big. It's bigger than any computer we can buy. Yeah, it's like you have 40 terabytes of data and you need to get results. You need to drive policy out of these numbers and analyze them. That's a pretty cool deal that you have a place where you can store it, analyze it. And that's what we have been doing and I'm lucky to have. I think it would, it would also plan. help people if you tell them what big query is. I mean, that's sort of our, that's our go-to tool. And Nathaniel, who you'll be hearing from soon, you know, has written lots of new code for it. But I, I think a lot of people who know about the cloud don't really know how it works. And BigQuery is really important. Oh, yes. So, yes, as context, I work for Google. I started as a software engineer, as Sarah was saying. And then two years after I started, I joined cloud and I became a developer advocate for BigQuery. And BigQuery is a product a cloud product, like it's a service where you can store as much data as you want. Like you have data, you have 40 terabytes of data. Perfect. BigQuery will take it. And then you can analyze that data just by knowing SQL or connecting it to other, to your favorite statistics programs. Like are you a fan of R? R will perfectly work with BigQuery and leverage its capacity to one, handle 40 terabytes and two, go over 40 terabytes of data doing joins doing analysis as fast as possible, which I know sometimes it's things that used to take you hours. Now it takes in you seconds without much thought. Yes, I, I like how you are smiling right now. Like, yes, that's where you've been. Well, it takes a little bit longer than a few seconds. Oh, yeah. When we ran our queries, sometimes they would run like we would have 200 tables and the query would run overnight on all the tables. Nathaniel, do you want to explain a little bit? I think that's possible because we were running a bunch of updating. We were like adding variables at the update. Being, so like we were mocking rows by if they were a website that was a pirate website or a legitimate streaming website. So as we were updating it, it took a while 
to update. But for each variable, it'll, like, it would only take like an hour for each variable. Whereas if we were doing this by in Stata, it was literally it would literally be not possible because it would just take ages and ages and ages to run. Oh, for sure. No, yeah, for sure. Like when I say seconds, for me, it's when it's something that took a night before. Now it's ready in forty seconds. Yeah. But if something that was just not possible for you before that you went overnight over two hundred tables, run regressions, run whatever you had to. Do, and suddenly it's I, working. I was working on combining FCC 477 data with census population data earlier. And I did it manually in Python on my computer. And it took like overnight to run. And I did it in BigQuery and it took like 45 seconds. It's just so much better. Yes. Once you get the data in to BigQuery, which is... And another amazing <laughs> piece of it, I don't know if it would have applied in this particular situation though, is that you can you can pay for the processing power that you want. And so if you need something done really, really quickly, you can have it done really, really quickly. If it's something that doesn't have to be done as quickly, you can do it much less expensively and of a smaller number of computers. There's everything is, you can customize everything to the type of computing that is most suitable for what you need. Sure, the ramping up is crazy. Like first I can tell people that you don't even need a credit card and you can use BigQuery, just create an account. Everyone gets a free terabyte of analysis every month. And that's a great start. Then you start paying per query. So you have one question, you pay cents for that question. And then when you're going to this massive scale, you have these enterprise programs where you just pay, okay, how much more power do you want? I know you're doing a crazy thing that's going to take your life. We can also make it last, put way more power on it if you're running at that crazy level. But the product itself scales from zero free to as much as you would like. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what you're seeing out there among researchers. So are we, I mean, I feel like we're a small fish, 40 terabytes, but <laughs> what are people doing out there on BigQuery? I mean, I've seen so many cool things. 40 terabytes is totally respectful. Like, <laughs> there are whole companies that have less than that and still they get a lot of value out of this just because it scales that way. People are even analyzing genomes inside BigQuery. Like, how do I transform your genome into SQL relational tables that other people can analyze? And that has been like uh, scientists at Stanford just being able to go through not only the genome of one person, but a hundred people, a thousand people at the same time at this scale. It's crazy and really shows you how much you can extend the power required. I know you, you do also a lot of, for your research, you're analyzing a lot of internet data, how how it behaves. You have this great paper that does municipal broadband help or doesn't help, and then you get to prove it econometrically if it does or not. I, I love that kind of research. I don't know if you are familiar with the MLAB project. Yes, that's a good segue for us to pitch our new project. We're, well, we're working on a beta project of our mm -hmm. own, looking at broadband data, what Nathaniel was talking about. And we've been exploring BigQuery's GIS tools as well. Mm -hmm. So we've been loading GeoJSON files. We used some code, Python code, to transform them so we could load them. And then now we're using a Jupyter notebook to run intersects and queries on the GeoJSON data. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's very powerful. Do you see other groups using that? Oh, for sure. I just need to take a mental note for my team. Like, this is our homework. Why do you have to run Python code to load these GeoJSONs, we should be able to just load them into BigQuery. That's our Google's job. But if it only took a little bit of processing and then you had the data in BigQuery, I, it was worth it for you. It's mostly because the FCC's shapefiles are not very good shapefiles. So like there are errors in the raw data that then we have to do a little processing on Python to do valid GeoJSON so that they can be put into the BigQuery. Right. Yeah, they're duplicate had, um, vertices. Yeah, we're trying to clean up the, the duplicate vertexes and edges. When I feel very lazy, what I do is just I load my JSONs as a strings to BigQuery, and then I do all of the processing, fixing, cleaning inside BigQuery. Like, even if it's an invalid JSON, <laughs> you can upload it as a string and then play inside that's someone that has one hammer that can do a lot of stuff. 
something that's phenomenal about BigQuery is the it's internal GIS capabilities that allow you to even run joins, like find things that are close to each other and optimize those queries. I'm sure you've been discovering some of that magic. Oh, yeah. So, Nathaniel, you've done a little bit of digging around the machine learning capabilities, right? Well, actually, let me plug Nathaniel's series where he kind of reconfigured a lot of standard econometrics tools for the BigQuery system. Do you want to talk about that, Nathaniel? Okay. So, there's this... So, BigQuery machine learning allows you to run a lot of different machine learning models, TensorFlow stuff, and like k k-mean clusters and stuff. And the thing that for our purposes, the biggest thing is that it allows you to run ordinarily square regressions. But as like a machine learning tool, it's focused on predicting more than analyzing. So like it doesn't have a lot of things that econometrics use like standard errors and F tests because that's not as relevant for machine learning statistics. But given the data that it produces, you can calculate those things. And so I've made a few programs that calculate ordinary least square standard errors and ordinary least square robust standard errors, and then combining stuff together to do two-stage least square regressions. Yeah. For me, that was crazy. Like The first time I became aware of TPI, it was when you published this that you had taken the linear regressions that BigQuery does, you had transformed them into an econometrics tool. And then I started researching all of you and what TPA does, TPA does. I subscribed to the podcast. I've heard so many smart people in this podcast that just being here is it's a big honor. But part of my job as a developer advocate is to be out there promoting the product, talking about how it, being an expert, like to be in Stack Overflow and answering questions uh, that requires to be an expert. That also allows you to know who I am because even if you don't read my Twitter, if you go to my LinkedIn, if you're using BigQuery, you will end up in Stack Overflow. And there I am <laughs> ready to help. But the other part of my job is taking what I see out there, taking these conversations and bringing them to the team. Like, look, team, someone is taking BigQuery linear regression and they are not at all interested in the model and the model, <laughs> the results of the model. All they want is to get the residuals so they can use them in their formulas and look at all the steps they had to do to, like, nothing else, you did a great job documenting and sharing code to make this happen. But I just found it phenomenal. So let me ask another um, question about the whole area. You said um, that you're, you're also supposed to promote the, the product, and I guess, you know, cloud is generic, BigQuery is a product, although I guess some of us who work in it think of it more as a way of life, I guess, at this point, not to sound too much like an advertisement. But it fits into, there are lots of companies that do cloud. It's a pretty competitive market. I mean, there's Google's cloud and there's Amazon and there's Azure and then Oracle and lots of others have them. Does BigQuery compete directly with services at those others? Or is there something, I guess, how is it different from the services offered at other cloud platforms? First, I need to be classy. (laughs) <laughs> I like being classy, yes, dude. But yes, there are more clouds. BigQuery is a pretty unique product in how magic it makes that analysis. It also comes from a place where so much of the technology that you see in current data center world comes out of Google, just because Google had to solve the problem to grow at this scale first, then it invented the technology, then it produced papers, then others took those papers and implemented their own because they could not use Google. And then comes the day where Google says, you know what, we're going to open up our products and we are going to share how we do our, not only the papers, but the products and commercialize them. So yes, there are alternative clouds, products like BigQuery. Maybe there's one, but I'm going to stay classy and not go like into the... I can list them. I mean, you might not want to because you're Google, but we looked around. I mean, we lo- we use other tools as well. So Amazon's Aurora, I think, is another tool and Apache, Parquet. And I looked at some Rapid AI, CUDA. They're doing some SQL on like big GPUs. There are other big data SQL applications, but I guess for a group like ours, like it's just easier to have a, a UI, like an easy browser window. And it's, I guess it's easier for beginners like us 
to just get started right away. But I do think, I mean, I have been looking at other solutions, but we still keep coming back because it's easy. Yes. I mean, before being a Googler, I'm an engineer that loves data. And knowing that there are several products competing for my lab, even if there is only one that I use, just the fact that there is more competition, it's they all push each other's uh, boundaries. And BigQuery, I'm glad to hear that stays is such a good place for you. Even if you, like, yes, you should always make informed decisions. It's great that you are evaluating other solutions. And it's great to know that you found your favorite. And if you ever find another favorite, let us know. That will all ignite the engineers more. Mm. So I guess, yeah, to wrap up, maybe we can talk a little bit more about where you see the future of like this kind of tool set for economists like ourselves. It sounds like there are biologists using big data. I mean, it's only the beginning of having like access to big supercomputers and then combining analysis on top. Where do you see like BigQuery going, you know, in five, 10 years? Oh, that's a good question. Well, BigQuery will go where you want it to go. So having people like expressing themselves is great. Something that's really crazy how much better we get the whole time is that collaboration and just influencing each other and doing like the fact that you have published what you're doing, the fact that you are taking one tool and making like do things that it wasn't designed for, but you're sharing your code there. So I only wonder how we can make collaboration to be even more fluid. How can I let more people know that you discover how to do econometrics in BigQuery, share this code, bring it to more people, share the data. Sharing data is so great. I don't know if you have loaded most of it or if you have found the FCC data in BigQuery already. I've been loading it manually. I'm not sure if it's in BigQuery already or not, but I've been loading it just from the CSV files. Yeah. Because, for example, data, we, actually. No. Mm-hmm. So we have made, we have public data sets that have the census data ready for you to use. The question is, were we able to make that connection and save everyone time? Like public data, especially for the things that you're doing, should be readily available and save you this time and let you focus on econometrics. Yes, I think at one point I asked you, like, if you guys could set up the FRED data, the Federal Reserve data. <laughs> <laughs> And then I think you bumped it back like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, there's Thank so you for many. Calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was me asking for free stuff. Like, can can no, you sure. do that? <laughs> so the thing we need to scale and everyone in the clouds needs to scale is how do we make public data available even more easy to work? And it would be great if the FCC just made it so easy, just they made all of the data available in a shape that you want it. If not, it's up to us, like a company, to have a program that ready to take your request. And I, I think we're going there. That's, I mean, that's one of our objectives too, obviously on a much, much smaller scale. But with the, you know, the FCC data and the broadband data and the MLEBS, including the MLEBS data and lots of other sources, we're trying to make it all easily available to everybody and, you know, and connect it. That's one of our objectives. And all that's yes. using BigQuery. Yes, thank you for taking the ball. I should have said that. <laughs> if you have loaded all of this public data already in BigQuery, with a couple of clicks, you could make it public. And then the question is, how do we let more people know that it's there? How do we make it easier to find? Right. I'm curious, how did you end up doing what you're doing now? I mean, it's always easy to look back on a career and say, oh, I went from here to here to here. But is this kind of what you had predicted that you would want to do? I mean, I know BigQuery didn't exist, of course, when, when you start a career, your career, but you know, are you sort of surprised where you ended up? Or is this you know, the fulfillment of a lifelong dream? That's a great question. And on one hand, I've been very lucky. Like I found the perfect job for, I love analyzing data and I love telling stories. Mm-hmm. And I went to film school many years ago just because I love telling stories. I did improv theater because I love being on a stage. Huh. But all those were hobbies. Before joining Google, I was in Chile, jobless, because I wanted to be jobless. Like, I gave myself a year to discover myself. And you just graduated and, from film school. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, film school, I did, like, bef- in 1999. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, 2010, 2000, I told to myself, you no, know, in December 2010, that I was going to give myself a year out of the market just to discover myself and make money by, not even as an entrepreneur, but as an independent person. And the first thing that I started doing at that time was 
okay, how do I make money now? I will analyze data and I will write blog posts about it. <laughs> I just start, it's like the one place where I feel I should go uh, promote myself by writing blog posts about analyzing data. And then Did that kind a, of come to you while you were during your year of self-discovery that you just felt like that's you wanted to start writing about this? Because that's, I mean, I'll, I'll, taking a year off and doing a, you know, some kind of gap year is, is a great idea. I'm trying to encourage my daughter to do it. But usually you don't hear people say, and then I discovered I wanted to blog about data. Oh, the thing is, <laughs> I always done that. And the discovery like, is looking at myself and seeing that every time that I'm free to do anything, I analyze data like, even at any job that I did as a software engineer, there always came the time where I just started doing visualizations of it and showing my managers. Look, look. I, so yeah, that's my happy place. But my year off was starting to take off when Google called. So instead of taking a year off, ah. I moved from Chile to San Francisco. I became a software engineer. And two years later, someone offered me that I should be the developer advocate for BigQuery. Not because I wanted, not because I planned, but because they saw me, they saw it, and they brought me to my happy place. Hmm. So how do you manage developers? I mean, do you, I mean, I assume they're all probably somewhat like you in the sense that they like data uh, and like me too. But then that means they're also going to have all their own ideas about where they think it, the product should go, which is good and also could make your life difficult. <laughs> How does it work? How do you keep everyone kind of together and working in a particular direction while also allowing them to remain creative? Yeah, no, so I put myself on the creative side. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I just try to convince people by ranting. <laughs> <laughs> like, look, this is important. Look, this is good. Fortunately, we have great teams and great organizations that are way more organized than me making, transforming runs into PRDs, product descriptions, uh, OKRs, and everything that needs to happen. But for me, I'm just, uh, I love focusing on the communicating part. I'm listening, I'm collecting all of the information, like I'm out on Twitter finding your blog post that is like, wow, this is really cool. I need to read it. Now I need to make it a rant, internal rant, and then... Uh, let people figure out. But yes, it's a lot about knowing yourself, what you like doing and what others can do better. How big is your team? Depends on what my team means because <laughs> we have the developer advocate as Google, but then we have the BigQuery team and then as Google does everything, like even the file system is homemade. So right. it's a big, big team collaborating. And you have products adjacent to BigQuery that uh, we are connecting. So... It's a big, big, big team with a lot of different heads, priorities, but it happens. So here's a question you probably don't want to answer. Did you watch your boss yesterday <laughs> at the antitrust hearings? <laughs> oh, I did not watch him. <laughs> what do you think about it? <laughs> well, the hearings themselves, you know, these hearings are mostly an opportunity for the Congress people to give their own speeches rather than listen to anyone's answer. But, you know, I think slowly they're learning something. It's, you know, they ask better questions than they did the very first time they interviewed Mark Zuckerberg, for example. So, oh, yes. and also I think your CEO was sort of overall rated as having the best background. Cool. Well, <laughs> that's nice to hear. But, but yeah, it's, it's such a balance of keeping these businesses are doing a lot of good for the world. But it's also good that, I don't know, you know the markets better than me, how, how to keep them healthy for everyone. Yeah. I love what Google has done for me, like personally. Like I learned so much from Google, the web page, mm -hmm. <laughs> but also the the job place and just having a phone that gives me maps and the world has access to maps. It's just crazy. So there's, I mean, there's no way you can know everything that everyone does on BigQuery, but are there any fields or areas that you think have been notably absent Let's put it in two ways. One, whether something that's notably absent or something totally surprising. So like, for example, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities funds some digital humanities, which does some really interesting work that nobody you know, outside of that small area would have, would have thought of. I don't know whether they, you know, to the extent they used cloud, but there are all kinds of surprising uses of data. And, uh, you know, do you see some of those or do you wish someone would, someone else would come on to BigQuery because they have, you have tools that might be useful to them? That's kind of an impossible question, I suppose. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll put it in a different way. Like BigQuery and its uses surprise me every day. Most of my internal runs are, why wasn't it easier for you to load these JSON files? <laughs> like, 
all of us, we focus in doing this crazy stuff, this crazy stuff, like, look, doing the impossible is what we tr strive for every day. The problem is how do we make the ramp up very, very easy for everyone? And then you allow other people to do the impossible. But yes, if I have to call something out there, call out something out there, is what you were doing. Like when people ask me about crazy stuff, I quote your papers of, let me just take the residuals and put, condense these 40 terabytes in one formula that I guess you've used for years. Yeah, I like that you call our papers crazy. That's an excellent compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I come from outside of the world. I, as a side note, my father is an economist. Hmm. And he also, I feel very close to all the crazy stuff he pulled off yeah. back in his time. Right. Well, Chile actually was known for having lots of economists in the government. Oh, yes. Oh, well, and we have our head economist too at Google that I'm blanking out of his name. You don't mean Hal, though, do you? Yes. Harry? Oh, okay. Yes, Halvarian, yes. Mm. Another crazy thing at Google is that I can write to one of our internal forums. Halvarian will call out how wrong I am. <laughs> and it feels so good. Like, That's funny. Hal comes to a lot of our, attends lots of our events, participates in them. And yes, <laughs> that sounds like him. I mean, it's always in a good way, of course. Of course, yeah. But the fact that I'm doing my BigQuery stance, like finding correlations, or, oh, look, I can do correlations with now with BigQuery, and now that I can do correlations, I can get all of these interesting results. And then Hal will read my email because he's there paying attention, and Hal will call me out. That's amazing. I feel very close to you. I'm glad that you get to spend a lot of time with him, too. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it's also yes. interesting. Likewise, we Vinserf. Like, Vinserf invented the internet. And also, he's on my mailing list, <laughs> like, asking how to make MLAF data more powerful with BigQuery. Hmm. Side note, if you go to the BigQuery first day, like, 10 years ago, BigQuery was revealed to the world at Google I.O. The first demo that was given with BigQuery to the world in that stage was using MLAF's data. And it's all recorded on videos. <laughs> so it it to all comes it. together. What was the data at the time? Do you remember? I mean, MLAB has been, has been collecting all of these measurements. That oh, people so it's the same, the same measurements that they have now, just earlier incarnations. Exactly. MLAB at that time needed a place to store it and make it usable. And it was the same time that BigQuery was getting started. So it was a perfect demo of how to connect the bandwidth measurements and how the internet works. Well, that's a great segue for us, I guess, to wrap up. We have some more like BigQuery use cases that we're working on. We're doing broadband studies and internet home usage study. We'll be using these tools in the cloud happily <laughs> and also with a little bit of frustration because it's hard to load the JSON files <laughs> that are broken. <laughs> Engineers on the team, please pay attention. <laughs> Listen to Celine. <Yes. laughs> Okay, so I'm sending them this. Uh, <laughs> for thank sure. you so much for your time today and for all your work on Stack Overflow and Reddit and answering questions for us. Thanks. Thank you so much. Have a great